Hello, welcome everybody to our meetup groups in New Zealand, Melbourne and Sydney, Melbourne and Sydney through Dan who's here as well. And we are welcoming David Anderson today um, on the topic of scaling. We're really curious um, what's going, what, what we're going to have. Um, David, uh, most people probably know, but I just as a quick introduction, he's the founder of the Kanban Method. Um, Dan and I are Kanban University trainers certified um, by Kanban University. And um, there has just been um, two, well, not really. So Fit for Purpose book has just been out end of next year. And there will be a new version of the blue book, our Kanban Bible from <laughs> the first Kanban book that was there from David. Um, and he just said it's a big responsibility to um, to match the expectations on that. But that will be out in the next months. And also he's the co-founder um, of the Kanban maturity model and the book with Theodora. Um, so that's briefly um, an introduction to David. And David, feel free to add to that if you like. And um, so I'm the Kanban person in New Zealand for everybody who likes training over here. And maybe before we head over to David, Dan, would you like to have a few words? Yeah. Australia. <clears throat> Just like to say, you know, hi and welcome to everyone from Australia as well. Um, most of you all know me. It's good to see some familiar faces. And um, uh, hey, Amanda, I just saw that you've joined. It's good to see you again. Um, and everyone, uh, you, you probably noticed on my video there is that uh, Kanban Australia is a new conference that we're kicking off this year. So if you don't already have your tickets, you can um, check out the link in the chat. If you do have a talk you'd like to submit, there's also a link um, for the, 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 the talks. They're, they're open now for submission. Um, and we also have a few slots left for sponsors. So if you'd like to get beyond, behind it and sponsor the event, it's the first time running um, here in Melbourne, Australia. And um, really looking forward to seeing you know a lot of you out there um, if you can all make it, it would be really great to, to, to get it off the ground. So um, there's quite a lot of Kanban events all over the world, uh, India and um, uh, the US and Europe, but this is the first time really in, in our region that that's, uh, that's going on. So you don't actually have to have a massively long flight to go go check it out. So that's coming up on in October on the Monday the 9th. It's just a single day with workshops as well so awesome stuff and for all those that are new um, to this meetup group or dance meetup groups um, we actually have a Canva New Zealand YouTube channel where this talk will be recorded and most of our previous talks you can find there as well if you missed out of out on out on them and you found the topic somewhat important or interesting um, Coolio, David, over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, let me figure out how, how to work the technology here. All right, hopefully you're seeing that, Silky. Yes. Folks, if you have questions, we'll cover them at the end. You're free to check them in the chat and Dan and I will man manage that. All right, it's great to see some old friends in the audience today. Um, nice to see you all and thanks for coming. One or two of you are old enough to recognize the screenshot that's on, on there. The, does anyone know what it is? It's the mission of age. It's a screenshot. I'm not sure which, whether this is the PC or the Commodore Amiga version, but somewhere between 1987 and 1991. <clears throat> this is Populous, which is, I think, widely regarded as the first truly successful computer game that was written in a high level language, in, in this case, the C language. <clears throat> And therefore, it re represents a sort of punctuation point in the history of gaming. Uh, but it's also a game uh, about scaling, about growing your, your population and developing your society. So uh, I thought it was a, an appropriate 
a little metaphor. Like those of you who've played Populous have some concepts of how to scale, maybe. Okay, in October, I guess in November, the actual contract closed, 2021. I bought this mid-century farmhouse near Bilbao, where we have our European offices. And it's about, I don't know, 15, 20 kilometers out of the city center. It takes me only 20 minutes to drive to my office. It, it sits on 1.4 hectares, and it was completed in 1974. The, um, I'm only the second owner. The, the first owner and her husband, um, they commissioned the house when they were in their 20s. The lady inherited the land from her grandmother, and I think her parents paid for the construction. And they, they commissioned a young upcoming architect who went on to be quite famous within Spain and the professor of architecture at the University of the Basque Country uh, later in his career. But this was when he was also a young architect and he was experimenting with quite a lot of things. But for me, the most spectacular thing in this house is the mono runner staircase that you can see on the outside there. And uh, the, the, so an interesting building but the issue with it was that the, the, the couple who'd had owned it didn't really have any money to maintain it, it would appear. So it, after I'd purchased it, although I'd had some architects inspect the place, uh, we discovered there was a lot of issues with it. The electricity was very old and illegal. Um, so it needs completely rewired. It needs all new windows. Um, it, it needs the heating system replaced. The hot water system's completely inadequate for a house of its size. All the infrastructure basically needs replaced. The only thing that's really good about it is the concrete frame and the roof are in good condition. Everything else needs to be replaced. Um, however, it's an interesting enough building on a nice piece of land, pretty close to the city. Uh, which is worth, so it's worth uh, fixing it up, but uh, it was a little shocking at the time to discover that the property was in much worse condition than we thought before we bought it. So as a consequence of this, um, I, I spent quite a lot of time watching far too much uh, home improvement television. So. An alternative subtitle could be what I learned from watching too much home improvement television. And <clears throat> one of my uh, favorite shows and presenters, this guy, Tarek El Moussa. Um, I understand that at least some of you in Australia and New Zealand uh, will recognize Tarek. You'll know his, his original show was called Flip or Flop. Tarek's a property investor from Southern California, from Orange County just south of Los Angeles. And he specializes in buying up mid-century atomic ranch style properties, many of which were built in Southern California in the 1950s and 60s. So there's some similarity with my house. And he, he, he fixes up these properties and he sells them uh, for a profit. And he started out when he was in his 20s uh, living in his mom's garage and buying up one house at a time, fixing it up, selling it for a profit, using the profit to buy the next one and so on. Well, <clears throat> last week I saw an episode of one of his latest shows that was recorded very recently. And they were talking about the, the, the changes in the housing market. Interest rates have been rising. There's been a lot of inflation. Uh, central banks are trying to dampen that down. And that, of course, has dampened the housing market. And he was saying at the time that the interest rates started to go up, <clears throat> he had 93 properties in progress. So in something like less than 15 years total career, he went from one house at a time to 93 in parallel. 
So he's a guy who's illustrated how to scale his business. At the moment, he has two current shows that are running. One is called Flipping 101. And the other one with his second wife, which is called the Flipping El Musas. Flipping 101 is where he works with novice property investors and he coaches them on how to acquire properties that are worth fixing up and how to do it properly so that they make money and their business thrives. And his first piece of advice for these novice investors is you have to stop making mistakes. All right, so uh, that stop making mistakes because quality problems hinder scaling, right? It's just not that much fun to buy one property at a time, fix it up, and then go looking for the next opportunity. So if you want to scale the business, you have to uh, recognize quality problems and rework undermine trust in your brand. Fixing mistakes and quality problems costs you time. Avoidable wasted time carries an opportunity cost, particularly if you borrowed the money to buy the house that you're flipping. So there's a cost of delay associated with, with poor quality. Poor quality and mistakes mean you're unpredictable. Lack of predictability leads to poor economic perfor performance. And therefore, you need to hire or develop competent people who can work unsupervised. That's his number one rule, work with a general contractor and subcontractors who are competent and can work unsupervised. And the same thing is true for his own full-time employees, that they, he needs to hire or develop people who are extremely competent and can work unsupervised, focus on quality, and doing things right first time. His second piece of advice, and Tarek doesn't express it just quite this way, but it amounts to working yourself out of a job. He says things like, if you're in the bathroom retiling the shower, you're not out on the street looking for the next deal. If you're doing all the work yourself, you finish the house, you put it up for sale, and then you need to start walking around looking for the next property that you might buy, and your business is all stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. So you need to work yourself out of the job of tiling the, the shower and get someone else to do that and focus on doing the higher value uh, work and just keep repeating that. And this enables you to scale, right? So you can't scale without free time. This is the, the key lesson. And therefore, you must delegate, which means you need to hire or develop competent people who can work unsupervised. You need to build trust, which means you need to hire or develop competent people who can work unsupervised and focus on quality and first time right. Empower people without losing control because they're spending your money. So you need to have some control over it and recognize that Tarek is the accountable person. The other people might be doing the work, but if the budget gets blown, uh, he'll be the one who has to write a check for it, uh, for the deficit. So define explicit boundaries of authority and decision making and put feedback loops in place and use metrics and, and hold people accountable. So he, he coaches these novice property investors on how to have the appropriate feedback mechanisms and how to measure whether things are um, going well, that they're under control, that uh, they're within the limits of the tolerance that they, they, they're playing with, with the budget. And they have to think in systems, define repeatable processes and workflows. One of the ways you work yourself out of a job is to define a system that other people can follow so you don't have to be there directing the work all the time. Make policies explicit, define boundaries, 
of authority and responsibility. Sorry for the typo there. That, that should be an F. And create feedback loops with checks and balances. So you see that there's some recurring themes here that focus on quality and first time right, hire competent people who can work unsupervised, put in place the mechanisms that enable empowerment, but without loss of control, think in systems and implement the right feedback mechanisms so that you can correct problems and gradually improve. Moving on to a different show, a different presenter. This is Erin Napier. Napier's a good Scottish name. We had a mathematician called Napier and we named a university after him. And Erin, together with her husband, Ben Napier, who is a carpenter, Erin is an interior designer. They have a show based in their hometown of Laurel, Mississippi, where they, they help people who are buying up old properties in, near the center of town, and they help them restore them. And what this is doing is it's reviving the town of Laurel, which is about two hours outside of New Orleans. The, there's a general problem in the United States that small towns have been hollowed out over time as um, more and more people had cars and they lived in suburbs. Towns had ring roads and freeways and um, bypasses and, and so forth. Uh, big shopping malls on the edge of town, all this sort of thing has hollowed out the, the, the center of small towns. Often the reason the small town existed, the original industry has closed down. So across the United States, there are thousands of small towns, just like Laurel, where the, the, the downtown area and neighborhoods close to downtown are dilapidated. So they help these people fix up their houses and they've been fairly successful at it. I think the show's running in its sixth, sixth season. They've been doing this for six years. And as a consequence, people from other small towns in the United States started writing to them and saying, hey, if you can do this for Laurel, could you do it for our town? Could you come to our town and help us um, repeat the success that's been happening in Laurel. And the TV channel, uh, HGTV, picked up on this opportunity and that enabled them to create a new show called Hometown Kickstart. And then there's a new version of it um, this year that has a slightly different name, um, which is escaping me for a moment. Hometown Kickstart, they announced that they were going to uh, repeat what's happened in Laurel with six other towns. <clears throat> Around 3,500 3, towns applied. And six were chosen. And to scale, they had to enlist a number of other presenters from other TV shows on HGTV, Home and Garden Television. So they scaled themselves by, by bringing in more staff but really the mechanism for scaling uh, was based on, uh, on these pieces of advice, right? That actually, where's the quote? When interviewed about it, Laura, um, Aaron replied, you scale by identifying your leaders and enabling them. So when they move into one of these other small towns that they're going to, to kickstart the, the, the rejuvenation, they identify people who are showing leadership in the town and they figure out how they can help those people. They also have a system, they have a formula that they can repeat. And the formula is that they remodel uh, the, the home of some leader in the town. And it might be someone who works for 
the fire service or someone who works with youth development. It doesn't necessarily need to be someone who's in a, an official civic position. They pick a small business in the center of town, one that's been already showing some leadership and trying to make an effort to, uh, to rejuvenate the town center and they, they fix up the store. They, they make this business even more interesting and lively. And then they pick some public or civic space. It might be a building or it might be a park and they refurbish that. So they do these three different projects. With the latest show, they're doing um, 18 altogether. So six of each type in a town and I think it's in Colorado where with this the previous season they did six uh, different towns and they, they did these three things so they have a system like we heard from Tarek El Musa they identify their leaders and they enable them they provide them with the right resources so they find the people who are showing some leadership and they reward them if you have people in your organization who are showing leadership, perhaps uh, younger, more junior ones, they, they should be rewarded with more resources, more time, greater scope, more money, more space, more people. All right, the reward for showing leadership is you get to do more of it. Amplify the leadership, right? So encourage more of it. Where you have someone showing leadership, encourage others to copy them reward leadership with greater responsibility and more accountability. So if a leader is doing their job, they're working themselves out of a job and the reward for that is that they get greater responsibility and more accountability. And set expectations for leaders and the roles that they play. Uh, enable them, set people up for success. This is Aaron's key message. Identify the leaders in each town and figure out what they need to be more successful to show even more leadership, provide them the resources, the training, the equipment, the facilities, the time and space, think in systems, figure out how to create a system that's repeatable and therefore you can teach it to others by, and therefore work yourself out of a job, create an adaptive system that can learn and evolve uh, so that you can leave and what's left behind is a system that will um, um, be sustainable over the long term and inspire, lead by example, signal your values and encourage aligned behavior. If you do these things, then the leadership grows and you're able to scale. Now, <clears throat> having taken all of of this inspiration from watching too many home improvement shows, I came up with this nine points for leadership that enable large scale enterprise agility. One, value quality and avoidance of mistakes. Um, could someone mute please, thanks. Um, commit to work. Commit to working yourself out of a job at every opportunity. You can't scale if you're in the bathroom retiling the shower. Learn to view your organization as a network of services and encourage cooperation and collaboration across your existing organizational structure. Right. Scale by encouraging people to work together rather than going about reorganizing something into some big framework. Develop organizational maturity. The, the reason being that mature organizations um, focus on quality, they think in systems, they manage risk well, uh, they're much more resilient uh, and so forth and things that are needed for scaling. Think in systems, number five, create a system of feedback mechanisms designed to drive your organization towards agility. 
Right? So you don't just uh, come with some template and, and uh, insert the process. You evolve into it. You grow up in the same way that a business like, well, with a, run by an entrepreneur like Tarek El Moussa, he started doing one at a time, working mostly on his own. And after a decade or a little more, he got to doing 93 in parallel, clearly working with a large number of people. Six, define a value system. A, value, a, a collection of values is known as a credo that embraces and, and encourages agility. So if you have your value system in place, you can teach the values to others and this enables alignment of their actions without you having to constantly supervise them. And uh, I've got some methods that I teach, very simple ideas. The Agile and Lean Decision Filter are ways of encouraging the right kind of values. Um, seven, be an adaptive leader. Disrupt your organization with just enough stress to catalyze improvement. So if everyone's too comfortable, things don't get better. There has to be... Uh, um, a little bit of stress that disrupts uh, how people feel. And the concept of an adaptive leader is someone who creates that environment where people are just under enough stress that it provokes improvement, not too much stress that it will break them. Uh, and identify your nascent leadership talent, enable and grow that talent. If you want to scale, you have to be invested in leadership development. Encourage acts of leadership at all levels at every node in the network of services. That the whole idea that you have to come to the, the, the one Uber decision maker, uh, that creates a bottleneck, right? You won't scale, it will cause delays, uh, it will limit the your ability to operate at scale. Right? To operate at scale, we need different parts of your organization acting autonomously, but doing that in a way that's aligned. Uh, so we need to have leadership all over at every level and at every node in the network. Just a summary of these nine points. Now, if you can do these things, you're going to be able, you're going to have an organization, a large scale organization that behaves in an agile manner. So if I was paraphrasing some old Edwards Deming quote, uh, the, uh, we could say, if you want to scale, you should uh, issue frameworks and substitute leadership. Forget the frameworks, focus on leadership, and that will help you scale. Right, so <clears throat> summarizing here, how to scale, stop making mistakes, work yourself out of a job, identify your leaders and enable them. And enterprise scale agility, it's moving on here a little bit, what other let's say specific practices might we need, the skills that we need to learn to enable this. Right? First of all, value flows through a network of interdependent services operating with autonomy. First thing, see services, see your organization as a network of services, recognize that each one operates with autonomy. We have a case study on our website that was um, developed by, by one of our marketing team who used to work at Saatchi and Saatchi um, as the uh, communication manager for a well-known brand of shampoo. And I challenged her and said, if you were going to Kanban Saatchi and Saatchi, what would that look like? And recognizing that an advertising agency is a vast network of services people who take photographs, people who do graphic design, people who 
uh, do copywriting and so on in order to create the campaigns that they develop for their clients. So recognize the value flows through this network of interdependent services that, that individually operate with autonomy. Pursue organizational maturity because you need trust, you need resilience, you need an ability to learn, and you need to focus on quality and doing things first time right. Then you need leadership and management decision making at every node in the network. Each node needs to work autonomously, but it has to be in alignment. And we need feedback mechanisms in order to ensure that alignment and to ensure that we're improving to a level that's good enough for the quality that we need. Right. So I've broken this down a little bit. Right? The, of these four things, value um, flows through the network, pursuing organizational maturity, leadership management, implement feedback mechanisms, the table of contents. All right, so to make this value thing work, we need service orientation. We need to recognize that that's a scale-free structure. And actually Kanban works in quite a scale-free way. An individual Kanban, a team Kanban, a service delivery Kanban, a portfolio Kanban, that sort of vertical scaling, it, it's pretty much scale-free because one Kanban system just looks like another. You need to think in systems, you need to implement feedback mechanisms. We need an ability to learn and identify value and urgency and develop a triage discipline, the ability to know what to do now, what waits until later and what we shouldn't do at all. And understand commitment and capability to deliver. We need to be predictable, trustworthy, and we need to have delivery times and lead times which are thin-tailed right? because delay is is going to kill us it will undermine trust uh, if we don't have trust then we end up putting mechanisms in place that mean we can't operate autonomously and our whole ability to scale begins to shrink down into some massive bureaucracy that's very slow moving all right, so if we're doing this Kanban service orientation, some of you who've been through the training that Dan and Silky offer will recognize the stuff, right? That this is actually a, a real example from a German bank. And we see this uh, network of, of services that are offered inside the bank. And in theory, you can Kanban every one of these nodes in the network. And we do that with very basic stuff. The, the static method that we teach in the Kanban system design class. You, you therefore create a Kanban system for every service node in the network of services. And just a, a slide to show that system thinking approach to introducing Kanban. We encourage people to do this as a workshop in their organization and they learn um, by attending the Kanban system design class. And it's basically built around this workshop. This concept of a scale-free structure. So there's three ways that we can think of scaling Kanban. There's height, which is the boring bit, in my opinion, an individual Kanban, a team Kanban, a service delivery Kanban, a portfolio or a project level Kanban. They're all pretty much the same. Little differences, but insignificant. Then we can scale in width, we can go upstream and we can go downstream and eventually perhaps we get the, the, the whole thing from the concept to the cache. So we can scale out width wise and then we can scale across the network and we refer to that as depth wise. So there's three dimensions of scaling, but it largely just amounts to taking the basic Kanban stuff that you learned in, the, in the, the basic class and doing more of it. You scale Kanban by doing more of it. You don't need a framework. All right, so there's widthwise scaling. Uh, what we have in this example is an upstream uh, Kanban or a discovery Kanban and then a downstream or a delivery Kanban. 
to the commitment point in the middle, and depth-wise scaling out across a network. The, uh, the, the top one here might be the customer-facing service in an advertising agency. That's the, we offer campaigns, and we have account managers who deal with the customer, and we take their order for a marketing campaign, and then we have different services inside our organization for constructing that campaign. And our feedback mechanisms in the Kanban method, basic stuff like service delivery review, operations review, the Kanban meeting every, every day, perhaps, the replenishment meeting, the delivery planning meeting, risk reviews, strategy reviews. Uh, so moving on to the next thing, identifying the value and urgency. Uh, understand what we really mean by priority. Are we talking about the sequence that something has to be done or when something should be scheduled? Or is it just about selection? Which thing should we choose next? What's our priority right now? Or is it the way that something's being treated, its class of service, that the concept of priority and prioritization is very ambiguous and we encourage people to disambiguate. What did you really mean? And the concept of triage, if we're pulling something into our Kanban system with our, and we have a whip limit, so there's only so many things we can do now, other things have to wait until later. And that means some of them can be scheduled. Those later things, when do we want to start them? And what should we not do at all? Develop that discipline. And that's a discipline that someone like Tarek El Musa would recognize. What do we need to work on now? What can wait until later? When should it be scheduled? And what things that might be really nice ideas, but we just shouldn't do them at all because they don't represent good value from the point of view, in his case, of, of uh, flipping a property that he's purchased and, and is remodeling for a profit. Um, to make some of this stuff easy, during the pandemic, we launched this concept of triage tables that originated from one of our early Kanban proponents, Dragos Dimitriou, who said, what you really need is like scuba dive tables, but for triage. And that was a great idea, but he didn't know how to do it. It took me a few years to figure out how to do it. And we have this available as a poster from the, the website, kmm.plus. We also have an application that enables you to do it called Menta Triage, which you can download from Google Play or the App Store. And basically the app asks you the five questions that are on this poster, and then it tells you the appropriate class of service for, for an item based on a given start date. And it, that allows you to play with the scheduling of something to find out its urgency and how it needs to be treated. Uh, and it's available in a few different languages. Uh, understand commitment and delivery capability. So the, if we're going to build trust and we're going to manage dependencies appropriately, we need to understand when something might be ready if something else is waiting for it. And if the lead times for that activity are fat tailed like this, then we're not very predictable, right? This, this side here is unpredictable. And it's really impossible to scale when you're unpredictable. So if we want to scale, we need individual services, right? The lead time through here for this service needs to be thin tailed. entailed, predictable. So if we want to scale, we need to focus on quality, which will help with thinning the tail, but we need to do everything else we can to thin the tail. So these very low maturity concerns of improving quality 
and improving the predictability of our lead times, these are core to being able to scale. Now, <clears throat> we have some very basic guidance, which some mathematics geeks will argue with, but there are things that we know to be uh, true from empirical data observations. We know that thin-tailed lead times through Kanban systems, these guys, they follow the, the Weibull function. And the point where the Weibull function inflects from being this shape to, to more like this, the, the midpoint there is actually the exponential function. And just as, as this approaches the exponential, it so happens that the ratio of the 98th percentile, which is about here, and the 50th percentile, which is about here, that ratio is 5.6. So if the ratio is greater than 5.6, you've almost certainly got fat-tailed data. So you don't need to be particularly advanced at your mathematics to know whether your lead time distributions are fat-tailed or not. Um, upstream options can be discarded and uh, downstream commitment to deliver. Uh, so uh, upstream Kanban, this is from Optimizely. Uh, so all of this stuff is optional. And then down here, this is committed. for delivery. All right, number two on our list, pursue organizational maturity because we want to build trust, build capability and enable quality, create predictability. So this is about thin tails. This is about first time right. Manage risk and anticipate problems because we'd rather not have to fix things later and create a culture that values agility. And to do all of this, we have the Kanban maturity model. This little pizza poster explains the concept of organizational maturity using a pizza restaurant and you can download this from kmm.plus but level zero is basically where you have a group of individuals who make make pizzas their own way and the customer comes in asks for one and their personal pizza chef makes it for them at level one we have a team that makes pizzas but it's never the same way twice because it depends who's working on the shift today, how we're doing it. We don't have a defined process. We might have an emerging process, but we certainly don't have a defined repeatable way of doing things. And we aren't going to be able to scale if we don't have a defined repeatable way of doing things. At level two, we now have a defined repeatable way of doing things, but the outcomes are not consistent. It's never the same result twice. At level three, we fixed that problem. We have a repeatable way of doing things that produces consistent results. And if you regularly um, buy pizza, perhaps take out for your family, like my colleague Teodora Borzeva, um, co-architect of the KMM, the local pizza restaurant about a block from her house, that's what she wanted. She wanted to be able to call them, order a couple of pizzas, walk down there, collect them, bring them back to the house, enjoy family dinner on a Friday night, together watching some TV, and expect that the pizzas that she ordered are actually what was delivered with the right ingredients and everything's consistent. And if they say it'll be 20 minutes and she goes down there 20 minutes later, the pizzas are ready. They're still warm and they're tasty. The owner of that restaurant decided to scale. He opened a second location three kilometers away in a neighboring village. 
And then uh, a little bit later, he opened one in downtown Bilbao and then one in Vitoria Gasteiz, the capital of the Basque Country, about 100 kilometers away. When he opened the second location, his business went from level two, level three to level two. And Theodora and her family learned that they could only order pizza when he was there at the restaurant supervising everything. On the nights when he wasn't there, when he was at the other location, the service quality was poor. So what we have at level two here is the concept of the hero manager. And when the, the hero manager is there, everything's fine, but when they're not there, it isn't. And if you're really going to scale, you have to get to level four, where we have repeatable processes, we can do it at scale, and we're also capable of doing it even on days when unexpected stuff happens, that we're able to anticipate problems and the customer doesn't really notice any downgrade in service, regardless of what's going on. At level five, we're just simply the best in the city and our customers love us so much that when their friends and family come to visit, they insist, we have to take you for pizza. You've never had pizza as good as you're gonna get in this restaurant. And then at level six, if something catastrophic happens, like say a pandemic, the leadership are capable of reinventing the business in a way that might not have been possible otherwise. And, and the real world example of this it, that we have isn't a pizza restaurant, it's actually a, a, a Mexican taco place, which opened in Bilbao just one to two months before the pandemic and very quickly established itself as the market leader, maturity level five, the best tacos in the whole of the Basque country. And then the pandemic happened and it closed down in the, the old town of Bilbao, the uh, uh, very touristy part of the city. The owner reinvented it, making taco kits and making them available through local retail stores. And the reputation of the restaurant had grown so quickly that the, 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 the kits sold really well uh, during the pandemic. a little bit about benefits of different levels of maturity. Uh, at low levels, we get relief from overburdening by introducing Kanban. But at, as we improve, then we get customer awareness. We start to get alignment because people understand that we have customers and why we're doing things. Then we get customer satisfaction because we can do them consistently and produce the right outcome. And at level four, we can actually do that at more than one location. We can be effective at scale. At level five, we've got true organizational agility that we can reconfigure our network of services very quickly in order to offer new services to respond to new opportunities and shifts in the market. And at level six, we've got managed reinvention. We've got resilience and robustness to really significant changes in the market. Uh, we, uh, while we might have resilience at lower levels, we don't, um, we're not panicking because something significant has changed, like say the arrival of artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a little mantra for the Kanban maturity model, the outcomes follow practices, practices follow culture, culture follows values, and therefore we have to lead with values. All right? So it, it all starts with leadership. All right? We want the outcomes at scale. We've mapped all the practices in the KMM. We've also mapped how to hack the culture and gradually improve it to enable those practices. But fundamentally, we need leadership and the leaders need to lead with the value system, with the credo that we mentioned at the beginning. 
and recognize that your organizational maturity will always be limited by your leadership maturity. That low maturity leaders will not create a high maturity organization. You will not scale without high maturity leadership. And to deal with that, I de developed a leadership maturity model that you can find on KMM Plus. It codifies the character traits that I believe are needed. Um, and what we have on this list at the very basic level, all leaders need authenticity. Then, then we need confidence, charisma, altruism, empathy, pragmatism, integrity, humility, and duty at the highest level. And something that's not on this list, but is super important, leaders need to take responsibility and be held accountable. So as we, particularly as we go down here, we've got more and more responsibility and, and accountability. And all of this is documented in the Kanban maturity model. And the latest version is always on KMM plus. All right, number three on our list, leadership and management decision-making at every node in the network. We need to empower each, each node to act autonomously. We need them acting in alignment with our value system. And they need to understand why they're doing things. Who's the customer? What's, what's it for? Why did they ask? Simple rules such as classes of service based on risk and cost of delay to enable congruent action. I'm going to show you how that works. All right. So empowerment and autonomous action, leaders scale by working themselves out of a job. We've heard that before. Empower people using constraints, right? Enabling constraints for alignment, a credo, a purpose, um, uh, implementing decision filters to encourage alignment with values and governing constraints for governance and control. If you've only got so much money, you can't afford to run out of it. Uh, implement systems, codification systems, right? for example, for qualifying, uh, for qualitative risk assessment that we scale by making things easier to do, easier to use, and using mechanisms that are simple, but give us maybe 90% of the benefit, where something that could be very complicated and is really difficult to learn, that won't scale because you need super smart people to be doing it, that super smart people who've had a lot of training. Um, and then feedback mechanisms as part of our system implementation. Uh, here are the decision filters I've been mentioning. The Agile decision filter, I created this one for British Telecom, who were one of my clients in 2008, 9, and 10. And the sponsor there, a pretty senior executive who reported to the chief operating officer, he said to me, what can we as an executive leadership team be doing to help enable this 25,000 person Agile initiative? And I said, well, the Agile manifesto is all very well, but it's meaningless at your level in the company. What you guys need to do is focus on making progress with imperfect information rather than delaying waiting for perfect information. You need to prefer trust over control and you need to view work in progress as a liability rather than an asset. The lean decision filter actually comes from a year earlier, 2007, um, uh, an academic paper that I co-authored with a couple of other guys on lean software development. Um, and the first two of these came from my co-author, Merwin Mehta, who's a professor who teaches lean manufacturing at a university in the United States. And he, he said, value trumps flow and flow trumps waste elimination. And this was an issue for him because so many of his students came in having read something like lean thinking and, and their opinion was lean's all about waste elimination. He said, no, it's not, right? We will expedite something if it's valuable, even if it impacts flow. 
and we prefer flow over waste elimination. And to that, I added waste elimination trumps economy of scale, that we prefer to do things in small batches rather than, than have uh, large batches. And to enable small batches, we need very low overheads, low coordination costs, low transaction costs. So we eliminate the non-value adding activities. Now, these six little mnemonics, if people can remember those and use it to filter the decision making, you have a very lean and agile organization that can operate congruently with a lot of alignment at very large scale. Then we have classes of service in Kanban that are related to cost of delay. There's basic stuff that we teach in um, quite elementary training. And these four classes of service developed in 2007 have proven to be incredibly robust. And for the last seven or eight years now, we've had a solid mathematical explanation of why that's true, which I don't have time to get into today. And also on KMM Plus, we have this relatively recent downloadable poster that teaches dependency management and 20 different practices that exist in existing Kanban literature for managing dependencies across an organization at scale. So the interesting thing here is, imagine that we have a ticket that arrives from our customer. So the customer's on the outside of the network here, and they've sent in a ticket, and that's going to start cascading through our network of services how much information do we need so that the other nodes in the network, the other Kanban systems that get asked to do something as a consequence of the customer facing service, which might be our campaign development or advertising agency, how much information do we need in order to act congruently? And the answer is really not very much at all. If what comes in is an intangible class of service item, then we treat it as an intangible class of service as it cascades, requests cascade through the network. If it comes in as a standard class item, then we're going to treat it as a standard class item as it cascades through the network, but to enable it to be thin tailed and therefore predictable, as requests are cascading through the network, we need to ensure that there's trusted availability, that we have capacity allocated for the demand that will come from the customer facing service. And we can do that using basic capacity allocation calculated with Little's law, but to enable that, you need to have thin tailed lead time. The concept of an average needs to be meaningful and that only works if you have a thin tailed lead time distribution. So focus on thinning the tail, focus on quality and thinning the tail, the core enablers for scaling. Now, what if we have um, a, a fixed constraint in terms of delivery? It's a standard class item, but the customer doesn't really trust us. So they've set a deadline. Well, now we need to treat the cascading items as fixed date so that they come, they, they come through the system quickly. And we need to introduce the concept of a reservation system so we can schedule the start date. So an item that comes in here, we, if we discover that we have a dependent request, something coming down here, we're going to schedule that and then we know how long it will take to come through here. So we know when it will be started and when it will be finished. Class four dependency management. We have a fixed date item coming in from the customer. Now we need a reservation system on all the nodes in the network, the customer facing side and the cascading nodes and on the input side, for the first time, we actually need to analyze and detect whether the dependency exists. And if that's true, we're making 
different class of booking in our reservation system, a reserved class booking. With class five, we have fixed date and it's absolutely a fixed date. It's like Christmas, we cannot move it. And now there's no margin for error. And as a consequence, it's the same system with the bookings, the analyze and detect dependencies, but now we need an absolutely guaranteed start date. Our reservation needs to guarantee the start date for the item. And that will ensure that things cascade through our network in a very predictable, dependable manner and pop out when we expect them to. Finally, what if what comes in from the customer is an expedite request? Well, we no longer care anymore about reservation systems. It cascades as an expedite request everywhere. So if we know two very basic pieces of information, what's the class of service for this item based on its cost of delay? And does it have a fixed constraint or not in terms of delivery time? That's enough for every node in the network to know how to manage the dependency appropriately. No need for a lot of big upfront dependency um, uh, analysis type work. Okay. Right, David, last implement. Yeah, I was just going to say just before you go on, it's just time check. We're a bit, bit over an hour in now. So just wanted to sort of wrap up in the next. Part. I realize I'm going too slow. I'm very jet lagged. Um, all right. So we're almost done here. Um, all of this stuff is explained in the appendices of the KMM. It's available on KMM Plus. Right, and last, we need to implement feedback mechanisms. The Kanban cadences you're familiar with. This is actually from the third edition of Fit for Purpose and explains feedback mechanisms from first principles. We have our inner loop here. So uh, the, this inner loop, this feedback mechanism, we have some fitness criteria for what represents good enough like our lead time, target lead time. And then we're going to deliver some service and it took a certain amount of time. We're going to collect some customer feedback and then we're going to compare, did our lead time um, match the expectation? And if not, we need to take some action. We need to improve. And then separately, we want to ask whether we're actually doing the right thing. Are we offering the right services? And this is our outer loop. So we have some strategic marketing objectives. We offer some products and services here that in turn have their own fitness criteria. We deliver them to the market and it might turn out that we don't have the right market segments, the right products or services, and we need to change them. Right? So this concept of course is known as double loop learning. Right? This is our inner loop and this one here is the outer loop. And this inner loop is about doing it right. The stuff that Tarek says we have to be good at if we want to scale. And then over here, this is about doing the right thing. And this is what represents value. The outer loop doesn't matter if we're not good at the inner loop. Now I'll skip this Kanban. And this is just a summary of how to scale Kanban. You can look at this on the slides later. So summarizing this whole thing, Enterprise scale agility comes from pursuing organizational maturity and leadership maturity. And we have this new class, which Dan will be offering later in the year called Enterprise Scale Kanban, which basically spends two days on what I've just spent an hour on. And that's it. And I apologize for 
taking longer than I should have done. I could have spoken faster. I'm quite sleepy. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, David. And too fast, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. It was really informative. And I actually saw that people were staying online. So that's a good sign. Um, I had a very early um question on the chat and I'm not sure if the person is still online um, she was asking about let me find it uh, as it was actually um, Martin so not a she sorry to be a bit dogmatic but what's your definition of a system Daniel um, uh, Martin I'm not sure maybe it has been um, actually answered through through the talk. Are you still here? No, I don't think he's he's still here. But yeah, I did answer for him in the chat. It's more more of a system of work rather than a system in a technology sense. I think that's what you're referring to, wasn't it, David? Cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're definitely not talking about IT systems. Yeah. yeah um, good Aaron... answer, Dan, because I. I, I thought that it sounded like a terribly philosophical question. Well, does the guy want an explanation of cybernetics or not? And I think there weren't a lot of other questions in the chat. People are just saying it was the right pace, David. So it's, a, so it's all good. Um, are there any questions right now? And feel free to unmute and just um, just ask the questions to David directly. Oh, yes. Um, my name is Raj. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a question. The example uh, which you gave of 93 houses being developed in parallel, being flipped in parallel, how would you view those in terms of a large amount of work in progress? Yeah, it's an interesting one, right? That the On the show, and this was literally last week, and the copyright for the show at the end was 2023, so it, it had been filmed earlier in, in the year. The Tarek was holding a meeting with all of his general contractors. So basically independent companies are working for him. And the, um, that's where the 93 number came up. And it did make me wonder whether they had really thought about managing the work in progress. Yes, they have a constraint in the sense that they only have so much capital to buy properties with. And finding suitable properties for flipping is very competitive. So the philosophy that he'd had historically was if you find a, a a property that could potentially be worth a lot of money, but it's in terrible condition and we can buy it for a low price, we should buy it. And if we have the cash, we should pay cash because then there's no carrying cost. And if we have to borrow the money, what Americans call a hard money loan and British people would call a bridging loan, where you, you have the capital and you have to pay the whole capital back uh, in a single go. And until then, you just pay interest on a monthly basis. Uh, so about half of their portfolio was being carried on hard money loans. So there was a cost of delay uh, associated with it. But when there was an expanding market, the, he, he, no one had been paying any attention to that. And therefore, did they have too much work in progress and were they carrying too much risk? The answer is probably yes. And the, the changing in the market conditions really focused minds. So in the meeting, he said, I've told the team to stop all acquisition. No more additional work in progress. And then he challenged the general contractors to, to figure out how to shorten the lead times. And what we would say, thinning out the tail for delivery in some cases. And the, they instantly started suggesting things like, can you hold inventory? 
that a lot of the delays are being caused because we need, say, tile for the bathrooms and the, the tiling stores, the suppliers of that have lead times. If you bought more, if you invested more of the capital in raw materials and held inventory, we'd always have inventory available. So the, the advice like take some of your capital and put it into inventory rather than buying houses. And that would shorten the, the lead times, reducing their cost of delay, also improving their predictability. Um, and it was very clear to me that he was running an operation at scale with independent vendors where they had feedback mechanisms in place. They had the ability to understand the market and learn as a collective group of companies. So the, the latest season of these shows, I, I think illustrate that Tarek's even better at scaling than I'd previously thought from the, the previous season of the show. Great right. question. That, that's interesting though, because you, you talk about shifting the inventory from inventory of houses to inventory of materials, which is, I mean, like in a way that's, that's opposite to the Toyota production system. Cause you know, in Toyota, they try to minimize inventory of car parts as, as much as possible. So oh, and, they got, and I'm sure that they got absolutely screwed in the pandemic. Mm. Mm -hmm. In fact, generally, not just Toyota, but industries generally, they were optimized for efficiency and low inventory levels mm. and, and very long supply chains, like things made in China and being shipped to Europe and the United States and so forth. And they got screwed in the pandemic. And a, a lot of businesses responded to that by, by switching to much more local suppliers and using much shorter supply chains and uh, ultimately holding more inventory to hedge the risk. That very low inventory and very high efficiency requires that everything is running in a perfect equilibrium. And if you can maintain that perfect equilibrium, you can operate very efficiently. Uh, the, in summary, the, the, what we assume to be the rules of something like the Toyota production system, it has an underlying set of assumptions that assume things about the economy and the environment. And those assumptions are unstated. Mm. So just quickly, I'll let you move on in a minute, but just quickly, what's your view on that, um, on hedging risk by holding more inventory versus going I, like extremely I, lean? I, I think that if I was channeling Nassim Taleb, his answer would be that that's a business that will survive when something bad happens, right? It's a business that will be a lot more... Um, resilient and robust, where businesses that don't are inherently fragile, that as long as everything's running smoothly, they're going to be very efficient and therefore very profitable. But something bad and unexpected happens, they're going to get screwed. And if you're an investor, are you in it for the long term or are you gambling in the short term? Hmm. I, I can personally attest to the Toyota situation because my wife and I went to Toyota to look for a car and they told us now it's two to two and a half year wait. So they, they might have been, you know, benefiting some of their customers at one point in time or their business, but is they lost a customer now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there was a question posted in the chat from, was it Wendy? Uh, yeah. Can we see that one again? Yeah, or that was a interesting question i actually thought that too um i i thought that some of the agile people would come up with that um I confused about the idea of avoiding mistakes i thought yes. since mistakes could be avoided completely we could see them as an opportunity for improvement um so by mistakes 
Tarek's talking about, you know, the guy who came to, to retile a swimming pool and did a real cack-ass job of it. And anyone touring the property is like, oh, it's a really crappy tiling job on, on the swimming pool. That'll need to be redone. And anything of that nature that could have been foreseeable and could have been more, you know, better communicated, perhaps something that was on the plans, and then the contractor or subcontractor came along and didn't do it the way it was on the plans. And if it's either just done with shoddy quality or it's done wrongly, you know, differently from the plans, and perhaps that relates to the value. Maybe it's something important, like you walk into the main living room from the front door and there's a beautiful fireplace on the plans. And instead, the contractors thought, oh, yeah, they're too difficult or too expensive to do it that way. We'll do it another way. And it looks like shit. Well, you might have saved $2,000 on the, the work on the fireplace, but you've taken $30,000, $40,000 off the value of the house because it doesn't have the same wow factor. And as a consequence, less people are interested in buying it and the price comes down significantly. So the, these are the things that he's talk, talking about, you know, mistakes that are avoidable. Um, and if you're thinking about software development or IT, we're really saying at the basic level, don't ship stuff with bugs in it. And at a slightly more advanced level, like invest in usability, testing and user experience design and other stuff like this, right? Invest in understanding what your customers wanted, invest in writing better quality requirements in the first place. Are there some other questions that we've missed? I think for now in the chat, that was it. Is there any other questions, um, folks? As you want to swing out or sing out. Hello, David. Nice to see you. Uh, I I remember you saying like about ten years ago and and try to analyze and understand what did in countries like Brazil, for example, and I think that India as well. Uh, that they they just get it in terms of Kanban, uh, and you have a lot of cases and so on. And here in Australia, I've been here for six years. We have people like Daniel, like Silk, really try to get the ball rolling. And I'm curious if after all these years and on your course, you always, you always talk about cultural aspects in terms of societies. If you have any insights about why around here it has been a little bit harder like for things to stick whenever i see a presentation uh from yours this makes so much sense so much sense what well, why people are still like locked in in just pure agile methods and so on so i would like to take your perspective on this love your question yeah i, I it's also really lovely to hear you you're beginning to sound a little australian after all these years mm -hmm. Um, so it, I spend a fair bit of time in Brazil recently, and I've been thinking about why are we being so successful in Brazil and why are Brazilians who are following the advice and guidance in turn being very successful and their companies are doing better and individually their careers are doing a lot better. Uh, I think fundamentally, Brazilian companies are not rich enough to be stupid. That they're, they're under a lot more constraints and they've got far less tolerances for how long does something take or what does it cost? <clears throat> and perhaps a lot less money to spend on you know, exterior consulting firms, you know, the, the big guys, the Cap Geminis and the McKinsey's and so on of the world. And they, they need results fairly quickly. And stuff needs to be very pragmatic. It needs to be actionable. 
it needs to be something that you can get done pretty easily and fairly cheaply and quite quickly. So they're, they're discovering Kanban and the other stuff that, that I and we collectively have published. Uh, and it's making a difference where if I compare with the United States, I haven't been down in Australia since 2015, so it's been a while. If I compare with the United States, a lot of the companies we deal with are just too rich and it enables them to be a company, you know, they're, they're not very constrained. They're rich enough to be stupid and cost of delay doesn't matter that much to them because they're so, they're, they're so rich. And they don't need their feedback mechanisms to really work. That I, what I see with rich North American companies is that they've got theater or pantomime like they think they've attended a feedback mechanism, but all they really did was talk and not change anything. They didn't have a real, real feedback mechanism that compares well, what were our objectives and did we meet the objective? And if not, what are we going to change? So it, there might be some element of that with, with Australian companies. The, um, the, the, without doubt, the Brazil is now our biggest market by volume. Uh, the number of people taking Kanban training and consuming other services that we have is the largest in Brazil of any market. But we adjust the prices for different parts of the world, so it's not the biggest by revenue. Uh, but without doubt, it's where we're having the most success. And I, I put it down to the fact that Brazilian companies are constrained and they need results quickly. Yeah. Awesome, thanks for that. Are there any other questions from the group? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Hi, Richard from New Zealand. Given that companies that are, to, to quote you, um, not rich enough to be stupid have adopted these methodologies, do you see a similar thing happening, you know, that happened with Toyota when they, you know, obviously learned what they learned and put the systems in place that they did and then basically took over the market? Do you see some of these companies that you're working with, you know, also being in the position of, you know, being able to scale up high quality and then, you know, we'll capture the markets and at some point in the future? It's a good question. That, that part of the challenge I have personally is I, I operate a training business that, that operates through partners around the world, 350 of them, like Silky and Dan. So I only get to meet businesses directly if they happen to show up at a conference or something where I might be speaking. Um, so it's hard for me to really see uh, the sort of impact that they're, um, that they're having and whether it's enabling them to dominate a market. That's, that's quite a difficult thing to observe. The that there are examples though, I guess, in our case study literature over the years where some really very small companies managed to compete with much larger companies very effectively. Uh, uh, quite an extreme example would have been Alison Valley's company, Fidelis in Brazil, where they, they were only 15 or 20 employees and they made management software for universities. They had about 40% market share of the Portuguese language market. And that, that made them number two in the market. The largest company had two or three percentage points more, say 42, 43% of the market. They had 10 times more employees. So for, for the same market share, they were basically at a cost base that was 10x of Fidelis's. But that's a fairly extreme example. And it's also quite an old example now that's going back a decade or more. Um, I'm trying to think of the names of some of the 
Brazilian companies that you see it was one of these things where if I'd had some warning, I would have looked them up. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I mean, I, I suppose, Maybe. sorry, follow up question then. If do you seek some of these companies getting big enough to be stupid enough to actually abandon these practices? We we have one case study on our website, which actually comes from Volvo, where they did abandon the practices, uh, but it was for, it was different circumstances that um, various things that were stressing them in the market. That, as a general observation, low maturity organisations buckle under stress. And they tend to regress back to, say, old ways of doing things, the comfort zone and so on. And while we might assume that, that Volvo, who don't make the cars anymore, Volvo make trucks and buses and big industrial equipment and engines for boats and things like this, um, that it's a high maturity company, that would be true in their manufacturing side and maybe their product side, their IT division, not so much. And when it was put under stress, they panicked and abandoned their discipline and went back to their old, old ways of doing things. Have we seen someone improve to the point where they got too comfortable and therefore complacent? I, I can't think of one. You know, it could be, but I just I don't think of an example. I think it's still too early for that, for the most part. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, mostly maybe just to make sure I'm clear about what we, uh, what you discussed, David. So based on what you said, a uh, company needs to scale up when they're ready to scale up, not because they're large. Is that the right understanding? The... What we're talking about is the ability to scale agility, to do, to move quickly at large scale. And the, the way you put it there was when they're ready and what do you need to be ready? Well, you need the individual parts operating with high quality and high predictability. And to achieve that, you need some consistency. They need to be following some sort of defined way of doing things. And they need to be able to, they, they need leadership at each individual part of the organization. They need to be able to develop leaders. And the organization needs to be um, you know, a lot more anticipatory and better at managing risk and they need to value certain things like quality and predictability and so forth. So the concept of when they're ready is when they've matured enough yes. because they've got the right quality of leaders and they've matured as an, enough as an organization that basic practice discipline, which is enabling them to do things right in a predictable manner once they can do that they can really start to focus on uh, what's the most valuable thing that we can be doing at any given time and start exploiting opportunities to make more um, more money and exploit new new opportunities that come along sort of reconfigure the organization in a way that they can take advantage of an opportunity and do that quickly. So yeah, to, so the, the way you put it was really very nice that they can scale their agility when they're ready. And we have a definition of ready. Yes. Yeah. Because based on my experience, and that's one of my challenges at the moment, that Organizations are probably in maturity level one, maybe a little bit toward two, but because they're large, they want to scale, they want to have everything organized and structured at, at once, but they don't even have a one uh, system which is predictable. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, one of my favorite anecdotes, and I, it was either 20, 2008 or nine, but I was sitting across the desk from the chief financial officer at BT, and his name was Hamanshu Raja. <clears throat> And he was talking to me about the contract they had just placed to outsource most of their IT work um, and, and telecom system development work to three big vendors in India, TCS and WebPro and uh, Infosys, because the contract was so large, they couldn't just give it to one vendor. And he, he said to me, you know, the contract's for five years. And I said, yeah, I know, I've because I'd been involved in some of the negotiations and helping the two sides talk to each other uh, he said so that's great and when the contract comes up from renewal in about four years from now I would like to know which of the vendors is giving us the best value for money so that we can give more of the contract to the vendor that's giving more value for money and reduce the amount of contract for the other ones and I said to him, that's fantastic. That's, uh, that's called you know, comparative vendor analysis. Now imagine that you had a scale and I didn't have KMM at the time. So in my head, I was thinking about CMMI. I said, imagine there's a scale of one to five for how well a company's managed and how well it manages risk. Well, you've just asked a level four question. And that's fantastic because you're the chief financial officer of one of Britain's two largest companies. That's the right sort of question that you should be asking. Meanwhile, you're running an organization that cannot schedule a meeting. And the, the, he knew what I meant because that was actually a specific reference to a new initiative kickoff from the previous week that was supposed to be happening at an office in Ireland and people were flying in from all over the world and it was cancelled at the last minute because they weren't ready and all sorts of people including me had to rearrange their travel. So if you want, in order to answer level four questions, you need to fix the level zero and level one issues first then try level two. So I, I carried on the conversation with him a little bit about that. You know, you need to be able to do really fundamentally basic things first before you're ever going to be able to instrument and assess which one of these three big vendors is giving us the best value for money. So it, I think it's common enough and it's mm. the right thing for executives to be asking these higher maturity questions, and they may not realize that the fundamentals underneath aren't in place. So for us, just basic stuff like lead time data, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to compare it when you're in a low maturity world because there's a lack of consistency for what represents commitment. When did the clock mm -hmm. start ticking? And how long did did it run before we stopped the clock? And until you've got that basic consistency, agreement on what do we mean by committed and when did we actually pull something and when should the clock start ticking and when does it finish? You can't have any sort of comparative assessment later on. So really basic stuff needs to be taken care of. And in a physical environment like Tarek El Moussa's where he's dealing with house flipping, it's really obvious when the basics aren't there. But mm. in our world, that basic stuff is invisible. Thanks. You are okay. on mute. Yeah. Thanks, Arad. It's real nice. Thank you. Um, just realized um, that there was this chat pop up, popping up now, what an engaging discussion, and we don't want to stop it. Um, it really is a really good discussion, and um, there are still people here. Um, I think those that had to go probably for family reasons, that's fine. Um, is there any other questions? Um, I, I love what we are having here, and also David, in terms of 
I know, you know, you've got a lot to do um, otherwise. Yeah, I'm happy to hang out another five minutes or so. It's no, I don't have any pressing engagement this morning, but I am teaching this afternoon. Okay. Uh, just, just one other quick question. You mentioned at the beginning that uh, the Blue Book is getting an update, and you said that that was going to come out in about a month or so. Is that right? Yeah, so it's it's really a whole new book, um, but it is the replacement for the existing Blue Book. Um, and it's finished, the manuscript's finished. We're just working on uh, some of the internal illustrations. They're almost finished. I think there's one left and uh, finalizing the cover. So we're quite advanced in the, in the um, pre-production stage. So I, I think we'll have hard copy available you know, mid June, late June, the folks who are coming to the leadership retreat here in Austria at the end of June will probably have freshly printed books to give them. So yeah, it's coming very soon, and it's a, it's a little bit larger. The original book was seventy two thousand words, and the new ones. I don't know, 85,000, something like that. But really, um, there'll need to be a second volume because the, the um, uh, I want to describe the concept I've got is Kanban by the numbers. You know? So like, how would you do Kanban at maturity level one and level two and level three and level four? Um, so I'll do that as a second volume, and I'll work on that through the, the rest of our Northern Hemisphere summer, and I'm hoping that that will be ready in October or November. We have most of the material because we had to develop it for the KMM. So KMM is organized by, by Kanban general practice, right? sort of vertical slices on the model. Well, imagine we took the horizontal slices on the model, level one, level two, level three. That's how I want to do the second volume. But the, the first volume, um, the, the new Blue Book replacement, it is um, a, a much deeper version of the existing Blue Book in terms of the, the case studies and the background stories and stuff like that. Right. So what's the um, the best way to get notified about when that comes out? That's a good question. Um, the, it, so our book website is kanbanbooks.com. And I honestly don't know if the team have something up there. They, they, did, they had a page for um, showing some, some example covers and asking people to vote on which one that they liked best. And there is a registration on that page, but I'm not sure the page is still up there uh, because we were in, uh, building a mailing list of people who want to be notified. Otherwise, just generally watch our LinkedIn feed. Hmm. And to yeah. Jerry's question, um, usually we have the recording up in the evening of the meetup. Um, because there was an interruption and I have no idea why, um, we'll try to kind of technically put them together. So it might take a bit longer and I'm on a flight to Europe tomorrow. Um, just chatted with Dan in the background. So we'll try to make this happen and have it up as soon as we can. But no, there will be, the recording will be up at some time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Uh -huh. uh, is there one last question? I think that's a wrap, Silke. Yes, sounds like yeah, it. Yeah, well, it's been lovely to see all you folks and especially some some old friends and faces I haven't seen for ages. Uh, Craig and Russell and Amanda and uh, a few new folks. Orod is a uh, Kanban trainer. And uh, thank you all for joining. It's been uh, nice. Thanks to Silke and Dan for inviting me.
Thank you so much for being here. Oh, pleasure. Um, Thanks, David. Thanks. For all those that are watching this, um, Dan and I will be traveling to Europe. Um, so we'll the, the, the schedule of meetups will be a bit different. We will have an early June kind of lean um, coffee. Yeah, lean coffee or Kanban um, clinic kind of thing next uh, month rather earlier. So we will not be in the schedule that we normally are. Um, but that's okay. We are just flexible and just hang out and, and, and uh, yeah, see what's happening. We will keep going. Might just not be what you were used to in the last three years um, for a few months. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, everybody. Nice. Any last words from you, David? Thanks, David. Uh, from, from you, David, or um, Daniel? Thanks, everyone. Yeah, uh, goodbye from you. Austria. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Take care, everyone. See you soon, David. Bye. Thanks. Hey. It's just us now. Yeah, yeah, I'll get a Dropbox. Do you have a? I'll, I'll get a Dropbox and I'll flick you a link to it so you can. Um, I can uh, just. Um, I I actually use my own my own external server. I can okay. just flick you those um, links. Flick the files shame over. That, shame that David yeah. didn't stay. Would have been cool to have a few minutes chat. I didn't say that. Oh whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um. All very good. Um. Yeah. So you're flying off tomorrow. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'll be flying off. Probably in a, it's probably another three weeks away or something, the 20, 20th or 21st or something, I fly out. Um, so it's a little ways off. But yeah, have a safe flight and um, I'll, I'll message you as soon as I've got this um, video sorted out and you can hopefully just publish it up to the uh, uh, to, to the YouTube channel. And um, yeah, we'll keep plugging away with the conference stuff. Are you, yeah, We what I might do is I'm going to push back the, review of the um, materials for for Kanban Australia, the, the things for a little bit longer. So um, probably when I get back from Singapore, because I'm stopping at Singapore on the way back. Um, How are you feeling about um, Command Australia? Yeah, pretty good now that we've got, you know, we've got one gold and one platinum sponsor. I'm feeling a lot better. I just need to we get more of these talks in the door, that'd be good. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, because a lot of them are in sort of draft status. So people have put something in but haven't submitted them. So there's a few more that are, that are going to come that I know of. So that aren't in there yet. So I'm hoping that we have enough there um, for it to get off the ground. Mm. It should be all right. Otherwise, we can just do, you know, a talk each or something. I can just throw something together really quickly. I've got pre can talks. Yeah, should be good. I mean, from the agile from the beach, they only also just started basically two years ago, interrupted by <laughs> yeah, COVID. You know, um, yeah, and this year was awesome. So I think you just need to start and then go from there. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you're feeling um comfortable in terms of finances and stuff and. Yeah, that, I mean, that'll keep me covered because, you know, the, these invoices that'll come in from those two sponsors will cover, you know, the bulk of the other costs that I've got to fork out for, you know, getting um, a mic and, and thingo over here. So, you know, I, I've got to pay them for their uh, flights and stuff to get them over here, Mike and um, uh, Troy. Mm. What I'm wondering about is uh, now that Russell Healy is actually on, yeah, I was meaning to ping him. I, I, I will give him a, a a ping about it, and uh, yeah, later in the week. It's just the last three weeks have been full on. <laughs> I've been doing weekend classes. Yeah, it's and it's not going to be easy because we are traveling. So it's uh, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I'll use the next. I might weeks. actually while I'm in Europe, 
um, I might look into um, my own t-shirts and stuff that I like with the logo. Okay. Um, actually, I was I was getting stuff printed for the others because Soma's coming down here to do a, help do a class with me. Um, and what I'll do is I'll get some t-shirts printed for you like we've all got, um, and I'll give them to you when we're in uh, Austria. Sounds good. And all sorts of other swag. No, it is so camera. cool that we, yeah, we finally meet in Austria after a meeting in 2019 in Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'll flip that to you um, as soon as it's ready here. And then yeah. I just, um, yeah, will be a bit of a delay, but I'll get it up whenever. Yeah, no drama. Yeah, it'll be okay. a two days flight, but yeah. Yeah. Whenever yeah. I feel like I can do it. Maybe I should wait until my jet lag's over, but I probably won't, as I know myself. Whatever. You'll probably be sitting in a bloody airport somewhere and just go click, click, click. Um. Yeah, exactly. And then, <laughs> then and then do mistakes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Classical. Okay. All right. Have a safe flight, Silke. All yeah, thank you. And see you on the other side of the world. We'll see you in Austria. Yep. Okay.